thinking that we're where we ought to be, but then when we check ourselves, we're not. And it is time to check ourselves, is it not? By that I mean, are you really where you ought to be? And you know, a question I ask is, how long does it take for you to get where you ought to be? 
How long does it take to be saved? No time at all, except Jesus, and then what are you? The journey starts, you haven't accepted him. You don't have to go to him, he comes to you. Make sense? Adam and Eve didn't go to Jesus, he came to them, when you look at Genesis chapter three. So Jesus is always there, it's up to us to recognize that he is. And having done so, it's then that we walk with him. He's trying to get us to start walking in the opposite direction. So we're walking away from him, we recognize that he's there, he turns us around, then the walk starts. It only takes an instant to be saved, except Jesus that you're saved. Make sense? But it's sometimes too, too good to be true. If someone were to come to your door and say, here's a million pounds, what would you think? What would you think? You think there's gotta be a catch. It couldn't be that easy. You know, if something is too good to be true, the world will tell you, it's because it is. But that's not the case where the gospel is concerned. It really is free. It really has been paid for. And it's sometimes difficult to believe because we're conditioned into thinking that we have to earn what we get. And there's nothing wrong with earning what you get, but where salvation is concerned, Jesus earned it, and it's a gift to you if you want it. Make sense? Who wants that gift? What do you have to give for it? Jesus has given everything for it, but the sin that you have to give, and that's your all to it, full commitment to it, partial commitment is good, it's better than no commitment at all, but partially committed people won't get to heaven, only those who are fully surrendered will. Is it a struggle? Yes. It can be. Why? Because of us. We make it hard, don't we, sometimes? Yeah. Salvation ain't easy, it's hard. Um, because of the way that we often are and because of the experiences we've had. And I'm hoping that um, as we go through the Bible this week, you'll be blessed. I've been blessed going through what I'm going to share with you. I'm hoping that you'll be blessed going through what I've been through. Um, I'm going to let the Spirit lead. I've got a broad idea of what I want to do by the grace of God. And the Lord will lead. Um, I'm just going to kneel and say a short prayer, a silent prayer. I'm praying for me and I'm praying for you. Please, 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 please pray for me and pray for yourselves. Just for a moment or two. A silent prayer I pray and I'm asking you to do the same. I was going to say, where, where was the scripture really taken from? But then I looked behind me and saw that all you got to do is look up. The Bible says, look up for your redemption, for us. And I look up if you want to know where the scripture really is taken from. Hosea 12 and verse 10. I'm not going to preach from Hosea. I've drawn that text from the 12th chapter to kind of highlight a, a few things. Um, the Lord speaks to us through his word, through prophets. Prophets aren't just people who tell the future based on what God has revealed to them. Prophets are people who speak on behalf of the Lord. Prophesying can be just telling people about God. So how many of us are prophets? All of us really in the sense that we're all in a position to tell people about God. Yeah? We all do it in different ways. Everyone has something to do. Everyone has something to do. Yeah? Make sense? All of you have been given a job to do, but not all the same job. Who here knows their talent? Some people say yes, some people are tentative. Who doesn't? Who knows what talents are? But often we think that talents are singing like John Delvis did, or teaching, or preaching. But those are talents, yes, but there are lots of talents that we don't have to recognize. You know, breathing is a talent, right? Everyone can do it. Makes sense to so lots of people who passed away, they can't do it anymore. Seeing is a talent. Speaking is a talent. Hearing is a talent. We don't think that they're good because we can do them. And we take them for granted. <coughs> Ask a blind person how precious, would, uh, how precious sight is. <coughs> because lots of us have, have lots of things that we take for granted. We don't see them as talents. Yeah? Speaking is a talent. What should you use that talent to do? What, what should you do with that talent? Let me see. Tell people about God with, with the talent of speech. You know, hospitality is a talent. Being hospitable is a talent. Some people have the talent of being friendly. Some people don't. Yeah, some people are friendly, but you wouldn't guess that they're friendly until you get to know them. 
But some people, when you come into a room, they make it's almost like it's second nature for them to just make you feel at home and comfortable. That's the key to hospitality. Is that important to the church? Is it where those people, where, where should you position those people? At the door, because if you don't get good people on the door, then who's the person preaching to? Because no one's come in because they don't think the church is warm enough to, 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 to enter into. So there are lots of different talents. That's a bit of a side step from where we're going to go. But we pray to the Lord to ask Him to show you what your talent is. If you're not sure what it is, you definitely have at least one talent. Yeah, use it for the glory of God. In Daniel chapter 1, the three Hebrew boys in Daniel were blessed with certain skills. And then God gave Daniel, he, what was, in fact, let me test you, your knowledge of Daniel 1. What, what skill was Daniel blessed with? The ability to understand dreams and visions. That was a talent that God gave to him. Then what happens in chapter 2? Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and a vision that Daniel has the talent to help him with. So when you're given your talents, you'll always come across someone who needs your talent that they might see the Lord more clearly. Make sense? So God gives you talents to, to reveal him to people. So is it difficult to reveal him to people if you're not aware of what your talents are, maybe? Is it difficult to work for the Lord if you're not sure what your talent is? Make sense? So ask the Lord to show you what your talents are. Yeah? Because it's important that you know what, what, what they are, because you can help people. You'll be quicker to help people know what you're going to do with by the grace of God. Daniel doesn't, hes doesn't hesitate to go to the king because he knew what his talent was. When he heard the dream, or that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and a vision, he was quick to go to Nebuchadnezzar, not based upon assumption, but his confidence is based upon the fact that he knew he needed to help because of the talent that the Lord had given him. Yeah? Hosea 12 and verse 10 describes prophets, it describes visions. In the version on the screen, it says, I have given symbols. In the King James, it says similitudes. That word similitude can also be translated into the English word parable. Yeah? So a parable is something that the Lord uses to speak to us. In parables, Jesus uses the scene, that which we can see to help us to understand things that we can't see. Yeah? So Jesus uses parables to open our eyes to spiritual truths. He uses that which we're familiar with to help us to understand that which we're not too sure about. Does that make sense? In Matthew 13, for example, Jesus talks of a seed sower, a parable of the seed sower, that the man sowing seeds um, plants his seeds in the ground and they grow and so on and so forth. Now what we see in that particular chapter is Jesus opening up the significance of parables in the sense that he says that the seed represents the word of God, the soul represents the heart, the seed sower is the person who preaches the gospel, and so what Jesus does, he opens up to us the significance of the little things that we see used in parables. They're spiritual lessons, they're natural things used to help us to understand the supernatural. The supernatural, by that I mean what God can do alone. When I say supernatural, I'm not talking about ghosts and goblins and the things that people may be focused on around this time of the year. What, ha what special event happened on the 31st of October in 1517? What began on the 31st of October 1517? Reformation. The Reformation. Well, what do people recognise that date for today? Witches and goblins and pumpkins and so on and so forth. But 502 years ago, Martin Luther began what we call now the, the Reformation. Maybe the devil's trying to bury that using Halloween, which roughly translates all which is evening. Uh, and when you look at what the, 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 the pagans would do back on Halloween, back in, in, in history, they, they would get up to some evil stuff. And trick or treating is derived from what they would do. Yeah? Look into the history of Halloween and what the Druids would do back in the day in this very same country. Um, so what I want to do is focus your attention on a very, I would say, familiar story. If you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to pick up the story in verse... 25. I'm going to bounce between Luke 10 and Matthew chapter 22. In the two particular chapters, you've got two lawyers. 
Now, that, they're not lawyers in the sense that they know the law of the land or that their expertise is, is, is co connected to the law of the land. They're lawyers in the sense that they're experts in the law. That would be the law of Moses. Make sense? So the two guys that are referenced in uh, Matthew 22, that would be verse... From around verse 34, and Luke 10, from around verse 25, there are two lawyers mentioned, experts in the law. That means that if you have a question about the Bible, these guys know the answer, or should know the answer. Yeah? We're going to look at how the story plays out, what Jesus does, and what I want to do, using the story that we'll, 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 anal we'll analyze, is, is take up the principles... Look at the situation and the circumstances de de described and place them in our time and apply them to us. Yeah? So what the lawyer does, we'll look at how we can learn from that. How Jesus responds to the lawyer, we'll look at how we can learn, or what we can learn from that. Yeah? So look at Jesus and the lawyer, what Jesus does. We have to walk even as Jesus walked, 1 John 2 and verse 6. So how Jesus deals with the lawyer is how we ought to deal with those who come and question us. As individuals, as the church. Follow me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so verse 25 of Luke 10 reads, And behold, a certain lawyer, or an expert in the law of Moses, um, stood up and did what? And tempted him. Tempted who? Jesus. Now when it says tempted him, what does that mean? What's, what's the lawyer's intention here? Does he have good intentions? Now he's, he's, chucking, he's looking to test Jesus in some way, to try and catch it out. Now remember, these experts in the law, they didn't have much love for Jesus. Why? Because he was continually exposing their foolishness. It, it's not that he was calling them fools, but in the way that he presented himself, he, he kind of exposed them. In the sense that they were looking at him and people were looking at Jesus and comparing Jesus to them. And the people started thinking, well, this guy seems to be doing things right. That means that these other guys that we've been following have been doing things wrong. And what did Jesus do at the start of his ministry that they didn't like? When he went into the temple, who did he find there? He found the money changers. You know what the money changers were doing? They were selling sacrifices that people would have to use to, to gain forgiveness. So what, what were they actually selling? They were trying to sell the gospel. Jesus didn't like that, so he went in there, cast over the tables and said, you know, my father's house should be called the house of prayer. As and when he did that, these people were making money off of the gospel, a false gospel at that, they began to think, we've got to get rid of this guy because he's exposing us. And so what they would try and do would, would, would catch, catch him out. It's like elsewhere in the Gospel of John when they find a woman caught in the very act of adultery. Where's the man for a start? They bring him to Jesus and they try and catch him out even there and then. They say, well, the law of Moses says that she should be killed. What do you say? This they say, tempt him. Or in other words, we're going to catch him out with this. Because if he says she should die, you can go to the Romans and say, ah, oh, Jesus is saying it's okay to kill people, and only you have the authority to do that. If he says you should live, they can go to the Jews and say, ah, oh, look, this guy, you fix better than us. He's asking people or telling people that it's okay to go against the law of Moses. So they were always trying to catch Jesus out because they had no love for him. Make sense? So Jesus is here being questioned by a man with an ulterior motive. He's asking a loaded question. He's trying to catch Jesus out. He, he isn't really seeking for understanding. He thinks he's already got it. Yeah? He says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Should he know? Mm -hmm. If he's an expert in the law, he should know. Yeah. So why is he asking Jesus? Why is he asking a question that he knows the answer to? Remember, he's trying to test Jesus. He's trying to corner Jesus into saying something that he could use against him. What does Jesus say? What is written in the law? Two questions or a twofold question. Verse 11 and 26. What's written in the law and what does it mean to you? That's what he's saying. So tell me what the law says, expert in the law, and then tell me what you think it means. What does the guy do? Verse 27. And answering said, he quotes two texts Deuteronomy 6 5 and Leviticus 19 and verse 18. So he's able to regurgitate what the law says. He knows the Bible about that back of his hand. Sometimes when we see people who can do that, we think, oh, this person must be a godly person because they know the Bible. Is it good to know the truth? Yes. Is it enough just to know the truth? 
Now, I don't believe who you should meet from the children of good and evil. It's still late from there. So knowing the truth is good and right and necessary, but just knowing the truth is a start. Believing that God exists is good and necessary, but just believing that he exists isn't enough. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that without faith it's impossible to please who? God, for all that come to him, must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that do what? Diligently seek him. So it's good to believe that God is real, but not enough. Even the demons, according to James, believe and tremble. But do they do what God expects of them? No, they just believe. That, how can they deny that he exists? They've seen him. It's not enough to know the truth. It's not enough to believe that God exists. You have to act upon both. Act upon the fact that you know the truth by putting it into practice. Act upon the fact that you believe in God by having a relationship with him. Make sense? So it's good to believe that the truth is true because it can't be anything else. It's good to believe that God exists, but it's not enough to know the truth. It's not enough to believe that God exists. You've got to put something into practice. Faith with our works is dead. Are we saved by our works? No, we work because we're saved. When do we get our reward? As and when we're saved. When are you saved? As and when you accept Jesus. Make sense? We work because we're saved. Does, does that make sense? We work because we're saved. Our motivation for working is the fact that we believe that we're saved. And we recognize that that salvation is an expression of love from God to us. We love him, 1 John 4 and verse 19. Why? Because he first loved us. How does he prove that he loves us? While we are sinners, he sent his son to die for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, but whosoever believes in him should not but have everlasting life. There's that free gift. As and when you accept Jesus, Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Then you work, not because you want to earn anything, but because you've already got something that you want people to experience as well. We work because we're saved. We don't save, we don't, we don't work to be saved, we a saved soul we work. So every Christian should be a worker. We should all be workers. So this guy is trying to catch Jesus out. Jesus responds to him by saying, What does the law say? Expert in the law, what does the law say? And what does it mean? The guy quotes two, two, two verses, Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5, and Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Verse 27 reads, and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. So it's a twofold question. What does the law say? What does it mean? Yeah? In order to answer the question, the guy quotes two texts. Yeah, in relation to God and his neighbor. Yeah? But notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't explain what those texts mean to him, he just quotes them. So he knows his Bible, but he doesn't necessarily know what the Bible means. And that's the thing, it's good to know scriptures, but what do they mean? It's good to know scriptures, but it's it's important to know the power of the word. In Matthew 29, 22 verse 29, Jesus says you do err, not knowing the scripture or the power thereof. So even when you know the scripture, do you appreciate the power of the scripture? This is why it's key that the first story that we're given in the scripture is a perfect um, magnification of the power of the word of God. What's the first verse of the Bible say? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. What's the second verse say? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the water, the spirit moved upon. And what did God say? And God said, let there be light. And what happened? Why? Because God said it. Does that make sense? So when God says something, something comes into being that previously wasn't there. Yeah? So the word of God changes things. It brings things into existence. If we are to be saved, what needs, what, how do we experience change? What changes us? <clears throat> the same word. So as the world was created by the word of God, so we are recreated by the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, If any man, if any woman, be in Christ, having accepted him, they are what? A new creature or creation. How does God create? By his word. John 17 verse 17, sanctify them, change them up by thy word. By thy truth, thy word is truth. So the word of God is what changes us. 
This is why we have to be in the Word of God. And who, the Word of God, remember, is a who and not a what. It's a who in the sense that it's Jesus. When we behold Jesus through His Word, what happens to us? He changes us from the inside out. From the inside out. He's looking to change our minds, our hearts. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2 and verse 5. Romans 12 and verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Verse 1 of Romans 12 says it's your reasonable service. Or in other words, God isn't asking you to do something that's not possible. Amen. He wants us to experience a change of heart. He wants us to experience a change on the inside. Because what happens then is things on the outside fall into place. What do we sometimes try and do though? We try and sort the outside, forgetting about the inside. And that never works. That never works. You need to surrender that God might do something special internally. And then the outside falls into place. We're trying to, I don't know, it's almost like God says we want to clean your heart, but we want to get a cleaner in so that when he comes, there's no mess. So we try and clean up the mess ourselves so that when Jesus comes, he's not going to find mess because we're embarrassed at the state of our hearts. But he doesn't care about your heart, the state of it. He cares about the salvation, so he wants to come along and clean it up. But we won't let him in because we think it's too dirty. We have to let him in because it's dirty. So we try and get rid of the reason why we need him. Do you follow that reason? <clears throat> we need to just accept him in and he will clean us up. Stop trying to clean up yourself because you've not got the right tools. Yeah? <clears throat> so let's get into this story. Um, remember, the guy in response to Jesus' question what does the law say about salvation? Quotes two texts. Yeah? But remember, Jesus said to him, what does the scripture say? And what does it mean? He's quick to say what the scripture says, but he's not quick to say what the scripture means for whatever reason. <clears throat> what does Jesus say? Verse 28. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So the guy asks Jesus about eternal life. Jesus says, what does the law say? The guy quotes two texts. Jesus says, oh, you've given the right answer. Do what you just said, and you'll be okay. Now this is where Matthew 22 comes in. <clears throat> Keep your finger in Luke 10. Go to Matthew 22. And you'll see a role reversal here. In the sense that Jesus asks a question to a guy in Luke 10. The same question is put to Jesus in Matthew 22. <laughs> Matthew 22, verses 34 and 35 read, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Listen, verse 35, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him, that is Jesus, a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of the Lord. Now notice what Jesus says in the following couple of verses. He quotes the same two texts. But what Jesus does, he gives in, in, insight into the meaning of the text. Meaning that Jesus, he, does, he, he's just got, he hasn't just got a head knowledge. He, he, he understands what the scripture is all about. And this is what we have to be like Jesus and not the guy, not the lawyer in Luke 10. In the sense that the, the, the guy in Luke 10, he just knew what the word said. But the, 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 the Jesus of, of, of Matthew 22, he, he had a deeper understanding, he had a deeper experience where the word was concerned. Are you following me? So we need to be like Jesus and not like the lawyer. The guy who thought he was an expert in the law. Some of us think we're experts in the law. We think we know what we ought to know. But when we test it, we find out that we're not. Does that make sense? Sometimes we think that we understand the Sabbath and things relational to, to serving God. But when we try and test it, we find out that we're falling short. We need to make sure that we know what we know. Or we're, we're understanding of what we know. Because we're going to have to tell people about it. We need to be giving Christ-like answers and not lawyer-like answers. Not just giving what we think is the best answer. We need to give answers from the heart. And that's what Jesus did. This guy in, in Luke 10 turning back there, he's just, he can just regurgitate the scripture. There's no depth to his experience. He just knows what the Bible says. It's right and good to know what the Bible says, but you can't stop there thinking, I'm okay because I know what the Bible says. You need to know the God of the Bible. Yeah? Now bear in mind, as we go back to Luke 10, one of my favourite scriptures is Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Now whenever you're studying your Bible, bear in mind, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, it refers to, I'm just paraphrasing, it refers to this Bible that we have as a sharp two-edged sword. 
It goes on to say at the latter end of the verse, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, it is, that is the word, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So when you, you study your word, when you read the Bible, when you're studying your Bible, the Bible that you're reading or studying is studying you. Because it's a discerner of your thoughts and intents of your heart. So the attitude that you approach the scripture with determines the, the, the response that you get from the scripture. Do you follow that reasoning? In the sense that the Bible will talk to you as it's alive, according to where you are. Yeah? Sometimes we say, I didn't see that in a text before. When I read that text before, I didn't see that. It's more so that you didn't need to hear what the, the scripture had to say to you before in the same way as you need it now. So the scripture will talk to you, determine, it's determined, how the scripture talks to you, let's put it this way, is determined by where you are and what your needs are. So sometimes you may not get something from a, a verse because the verse doesn't need to speak to you at that time, but later on in your experience, God will speak to you differently through that same verse. And it will say something that you need at that very same point in time. Have you ever had that experience? When you see things in the Lord, you think, ah, oh, the Lord's just spoke to me. He really did. It's not just a, a figure of speech. He really does speak to us through his... When you're reading your Bibles, accept that it's the Lord speaking to you as always in the room with you. Makes sense. This word is powerful. It's alive. That's what the fourth, uh, uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 12 say. When it says it's quick and powerful, the word quick there means alive. When I read my Bible, I'm entering into a conversation with God. That's why I pray before I read the Bible, before I open it. Because I want him to talk to me. I've got to believe, though, that he wants to talk to me. That I'm special enough for him to, for him to want to talk to me. And I know I'm special, and you guys are special, because if I weren't, if you weren't, Jesus wouldn't have died for us. He didn't die for us to make us special. He died for us because we are special. Does that make sense? We're special, and that's why God died for us. Yeah? And we need to accept that. We need to believe that we're special. Yeah? In the sense that God sees value in us that we don't even see in ourselves. Yeah, so the parable that's told, or the story that's told, is Jesus trying to help this guy to see things that he ought to see. Now Jesus does openly rebuke this guy and said, ah, you, you think you know the Lord, but you don't. But instead he tells him a story, and that's what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't like exposing people. Jesus likes saving people. He doesn't like to make people look bad. He wants to make people good. Yeah? So it goes on in this way. Now bear in mind what the guy says before Jesus tells the story. Now remember, when asked about salvation, Jesus says, what does the law say and what does it mean? The guy quotes the scripture. He talks about God and neighbours or God and people. Yeah, God and people. Look at what Jesus says. Do what you just said. Live out what you just quoted. And you'll be okay. You'll, you'll, you'll have what you want. Look what the guy says. But he, verse 29, willing to justify himself. What does that mean? The guy is trying to get out of a, a sticky situation here. Look at what he says. And why is it kind of a contradiction in terms when you compare what he says to what he just said to Jesus in answer to the question, what does the Lord say? Look at what he says. He said, who is my neighbour? What does he miss out? Remember, he, he quotes two texts. One text to do with God, the other to do with his neighbour. Why does he say, who is my God? What does that say about him? He thinks he's okay with God, but he's not too bothered about other people. Or else why did he say, who is my God? He says, who is my neighbour? So what does that suggest about him? He's okay with the first four commandments of concern. He's got no other gods, doesn't bow down to idols, doesn't take the Lord's name in vain, goes to church. But what about, um, honor thy mother and thy father? Thou shalt not kill, steal, lie, and so on and so forth. So this guy, he, he's, he's very heavenly minded to the extent that he's no earthly good. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? In the sense that he doesn't say who is my God, so he thinks that he and God are okay. So who is my neighbour? You know, who am I meant to be looking out for? Now bear in mind this question, who is my neighbour? And look at the story that Jesus tells. And Jesus answered him, said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now what I want you to do, I haven't got much time, but follow me. You've got a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So it's a person going down. Yeah? Now I want you to think of this guy as representing mankind. Yeah? You follow in the sense that we as, as, as God's crown of creation have gone down. 
Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. And what happened to them, unfortunately? They were given instruction to follow. Did they follow the instruction? No, they didn't. So they went down. And they saw that they were naked. What happens to this guy? He goes from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He's beaten by fools. And he's stripped naked. He's beaten by not fools, but thieves. And he's stripped naked. So what you to, to see this guy is typifying mankind. In the sense that Adam and Eve, our four parents, they were given instruction by the Lord, but they went down, they fell away, and found themselves to be naked. This guy goes from Jerusalem down to Jericho. A, a, a gang of thieves grab him, beat him up, and they strip him, strip him naked. So you've got Adam and Eve naked, you've got this guy naked. Yeah, Adam and Eve needed help. What does this guy need? He needs help. So bear in mind that this guy in the story, he represents mankind. There are lots of different layers you can add to it, but let's look at it from this. Remember, the title of my sermon is Much in Little. What I want you to see is the parables are prophetic and they open up to us what we ought to do and they open up a lot of stuff about the church. What you're going to see in this parable is the history of mankind, how Jesus helps, and what Jesus has done throughout history to help people. And you'll see that we're represented in it in a way that you maybe haven't seen before. There's a guy in this particular story who doesn't really get any... What is this, what's his story called? Good, we're going to see there's a good guy in it that doesn't get no credit really by those who label the story, the good Samaritan. There's another good guy in it. And the, the other good guy represents us. We could be the good Samaritan, but what I want to show you is a way of looking at the other guy, and you'll, you'll be introduced to him in a few moments. He represents us, and I'm hoping that you'll see and that you'll follow me. I speak really fast sometimes. So you've got this guy going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He represents mankind in the sense that we've fallen away into sin. He was stripped naked. Adam and Eve saw that they were naked. Adam and Eve needed help. This guy needs help. Look who comes by. Verse 31. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So this guy's been beaten up. He's left by the wayside, naked. He needs help. Who does, to a certain degree, who does God send to help him? A priest, where's the priest going to or coming from? He's going to or coming from church, that's his job. So this is a guy or a girl on their way to or from church. And they have here an opportunity to do something that is church. Church is who we are, not where we come. Though this place is a church, church has to extend beyond these walls to wherever you are. So church for this guy at that time was to help this guy. That was church for him. So his church was to walk to the guy and help him. A priest. We're a royal priesthood. So who does this guy represent? To a certain degree, he can represent us, those of us who come to church. But I'll show you that he represents something else to a certain degree. And depending on how you look at the story. What does he do? He actually crosses over. Too busy going to church. Yeah, too busy going home for Sabbath lunch. Too busy to help the guy in need. Yeah? Was it obvious that this guy had a need? Could the priest have made all kinds of excuses or not to help? Could have been a trap. There were lots of reasons why he could have said to himself, I don't want to help this guy because I'm taking a risk. Is helping people taking a risk? Does helping people require self-surrender on your part? Of course, he should have helped. He should have helped. He doesn't help though. He crosses over and carries on his way, either to or from church. Yeah. Another guy comes along, and I'm paraphrasing the story. This time it's a Levite. What the Levite does, he comes close and has a look, and then decides to cross over and go the other way. So what does he do? That's slightly different. He's at least willing to come and have a look. So he's brave enough to, to risk being jumped upon because it might have been a trap. But when he sees the guy, he's thinking, I don't know him. Nothing to do with me. Maybe he thought that there was no hope for him, so he carries on about his business on the way to or from church. So the first guy doesn't want to know. The second guy, he, he has an interest, but doesn't really commit himself to help him. Now we could be like the first guy, we just don't witness at all, we're not willing to help people at all, or we might just help those who are close to us, those who we know, those who we, we feel may deserve our help. Does that make sense? Now bear in mind that these two individuals are Israelites. So we can, we can say that what God does or what God did, he set up Israel for the purpose of what? Helping fallen humanity. What, did they do their job? 
No, they just walked by. So what did Jesus have to come and do? He had to come and do the work himself. Does that make sense? Israel was set up to be a light to the Gentiles, to help the people who were stripped naked and beaten by the devil. But Israel walked by. They kept it to themselves. They were so busy looking after themselves that they, they began to shun the Gentiles. Yeah? To the extent that they hated the Samaritans. Now Jesus is using a Samaritan to rebuke the people who thought that they were better than the Samaritans. The Jews hated anyone who was non-Jew. Even after Peter accepted Jesus, what problem did he have? There was a time that Paul described he had to rebuke Peter because Peter was eating with the Gentiles. Some Jews came and what did Peter do? He moved himself from the, the Jews and began to, sorry, from the Gentiles and began to eat with the Jews because he had a prejudice. When Peter had to go to Cornelius, what did Jesus have to do? He had to give him that dream about unclean meat and say, look, it's okay for you to speak to Romans. The Jews hated when when they were trying to get Jesus crucified because it was Passover, they wouldn't even put a toe into Pilate's judgment hall because they didn't want to defile themselves. Not thinking they were about to kill the Messiah. Let's not put a toe in Pilate's house because we might defile ourselves. They're about to kill the Messiah and they know who it is. So they had a twisted mindset. They had passed by the work they were meant to do. So God sets up Israel. They fail, so God has to come along. Jesus comes along. And he's the good Samaritan in this story if you look at it from that standpoint. Now bear in mind the Samaritan who comes along, what's he willing to do? He stops, he, he, he gets off his own horse or donkey, and he puts the man having healed or helped him with his wounds on his own form of transport. He makes a massive sacrifice. Now bear in mind the Samaritans were half Jew and Gentile, half Jew and half Gentile, so they were a mix of Jew and Gentile. How does that typify Jesus? Some people call him the God man in the sense that he was God and he was man, a combination. Yeah, make sense? So you had a guy, the Samaritan, who came along, who was a combination of Jew and Gentile. You had Jesus come along to the world where the Hebrews had failed, and he was fully God and fully man, so you had a mix there. So the Samaritan typifies Jesus. Does that make sense? You following me? So Israel passed by, Jesus comes to show them what they have to do, what they ought to do. Yeah, he asks them. To follow him, but what do they do? They reject him, sadly. So what does the Samaritan do? He not only helps the guy at the roadside, he takes him to an inn. And what does he do? Now, we're focusing now on the guy who doesn't get much credit, a guy who did good, but we don't give him much credit for the good that he does. Let's let's go to verse um verse 30. If I will start from verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. It, it isn't enough just to have the compassion. Well, you can't say, oh, man, I feel sorry for that guy. You've got to do something about it. And what does a Samaritan do? Maybe the, the Levite who went and had a look had compassion, but he didn't have enough about him. To, he didn't do anything about what he felt. And we need to do something about what, what we see around us. Look at what happens. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn or a hotel. Yeah? And took care of him. So he goes to a hotel. In the hotel, he takes care of the guy. Yeah? Look at what happens then. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave um, them to the host or the innkeeper and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now bear this in mind, the guy is beaten up, naked, needs help. God doesn't leave people beaten up and naked. He provides an opportunity for them to be helped. God sets up Israel to be a light to the Gentile. They walk by, just as the priests and the Levites did. Jesus comes into the world, the God-man, just as the Samaritan comes, half Jew and half Gentile. The, 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 the Samaritan man does what's necessary. Jesus came to do what was necessary. He started a great work. The Samaritan starts a great work on this guy, a, 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 a work of restoration. He takes him to an innkeeper, stays with him for a, for, for a day, and on the morning he's ready to be part. There's a good innkeeper in the story. It's the good Samaritan and the innkeeper, in the sense that the innkeeper could have said, no, 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 when you go, he's, I'm not looking after him. Your two pence isn't going to take me very far. But the, 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 the good innkeeper is, is willing to go above and beyond the two pence, trusting that he will be rewarded when the Samaritan returns. The good innkeeper is the church. It's us in the sense that Jesus started the work when he came, and he wants us to finish it. And he's saying, there's going to be a little self-surrender. I'll, I'll give you a start, the two pence, 
But you may have to go above and beyond the two pence, but I'll reward you when I come. Amen. So we're the innkeeper. We have a job to do similar to the innkeeper. And when Jesus returns, the reward's free. But we're not doing the work for the reward. We're doing the work because of the fact that we've seen how good the Samaritan is. We want to be like him. The Samaritan is Jesus. Does that make sense? So when you look at the story, it represents the history of how God has been trying to save the world for the longest time. The, 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 the story tells us in Genesis 3 that Adam and Eve were naked, mankind needed a saviour. Jesus sent um, Israel to, to, to introduce the world to the saviour. They failed, they walked by. Some of them may have had a look into helping the Gentiles, but they said, no, no, no. Only Jews is the people. We're only going to help Jews. Then Jesus comes, the Samaritan. He starts a work that he asks the innkeeper to finish. Jesus started a work that he wants the church to finish. And we're all part, we're all innkeepers. We need to trust that the Lord has given us the two pence. The Holy Spirit, a portion of the Holy Spirit will help us to finish the work, to heal the broken hearted. Yeah, yeah. That's what Jesus said he'd he come to do in Luke 4. He quotes Isaiah 61. It's our job to be the good innkeeper, leaning upon the example or following the example of the good Samaritan. Then in closing, look at what Jesus asks in verse 36. And think about the, the nature of the answer compared to um, the question that's asked in verse 29. Remember the 29, verse 29 question, who is my neighbor? Without reading verse 36, who would you say the neighbor was, according to the understanding of the, of the, of the lawyer? Who would you suggest the, na the neighbor would be? The beaten up man? Does that make sense? Because the guy is asking, who should I help? You'd expect that Jesus would say that the, the beaten up man was your neighbor. But what does he say? Why is it a strange response, really? He says, which of the three was neighbor to the man who was beaten? So he, he doesn't say that the guy in need was a neighbor. He's asking who was a neighbor to the guy in need. So he's trying to get the guy to do some self-reflection, to ask the question, am I a true neighbor to people around me? Yeah, if you're a neighbor, then that's, that, that basically, what Jesus is saying is everyone around you needs help. So it's not about looking on who needs help. You need to be willing to help whoever. So he's basically saying to him, you need to be a neighbor. You need to help everyone. Look at everyone as, 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 as being the guy beaten up. You need to be a neighbor to the people who need Jesus. And how are you a neighbor to the people who need Jesus? You introduce them to Jesus. So we are all neighbors, good innkeepers and neighbors. To be a good neighbor means to be a good Samaritan or a good innkeeper. Make sense? Does that make sense? And this is the thing, this is why we're here. We're here to, to, to help those who are beaten up and left by the wayside. And there are lots of people in Sheffield beaten up and left by the wayside. The, 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 the people are being passed by. Jesus starts to work in people's lives and wants us to finish. Yeah, he gives us two pence and says, whatever else you have to do, I'll reward you when I come. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And so as you study through the parables, and as we go through the week, what I'm going to focus on is things to do with the first, second, and third angels' messages. And there's a lot of symbols in there, and there are a lot of things that we maybe don't see or haven't seen. What I want to do is simplify those messages as best as I can by the grace of God, and highlight what we, what we need to do in response to those messages, how we are to be neighbors, because as neighbors, we need to deliver to people those three messages, first, second, and third angels' messages. How are we to do that effectively? It's not enough to know what the messages say. You need to add to your, 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 your knowing of what the messages say. You need to put the messages into practice. How do you put the first, second, and third angels' messages into practice? That's what we're going to look at by the grace of God. Thank you for, for your time. I'm hoping that you are blessed. And as we go through the week together, come, come, come along and bring someone. Yeah? Be a neighbor to someone and ask them to come along. Look for someone beaten up by the wayside, not in a literal sense but in a spiritual sense, and say there's some oil and some wine for your wounds, and um, there's the, the, the salvation if you want it. God bless you all. Amen. Amen.